we need to enforce better the laws that we already have. And to the extent, Mr. Chairman, that you're willing to help prevent uh, individuals from coming into this country that under our current laws should not be admitted, and to the extent that you want to stop the flow of illegal aliens into this country, and to the extent that we want to stop individuals from being able to basically have an open border at JFK Airport, uh, I look forward to helping you in that uh, endeavor. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. You. Smith, and uh, you did. You were most helpful last year when we moved our legislation. As you knew, it went through the House, but no further, on the airport's uh, area anyway. Um, Mr. Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I join my colleagues in commending you for um, your forthrightness in moving expeditiously so that we could hold these hearings. Um, I don't have a prepared statement, but in, in view of the, the record and where we are, I think there are several things that ought to be at least uh, put out in the public agenda for thoughtful people to consider. Um, much of what I've read in the newspaper recently reminds me of that, uh, that children's story, Alice in Wonderland. that I check attending a church where someone who may have views that are different from ours was not a federal offense. And as long as I'm a member of Congress, it never will be an offense. Um, the problem here is prejudgment. And the reason it's important that, that leaders must lead right now is because through inadvertence on our part, we are likely to say and do things that give people out in the hinterlands the view that it's all right to go ahead and attack people to, a, to go down to the mosque and burn it, uh, to attack people because they have dark hair and a nose that makes them look like perhaps they're Arabs. That's wrong. We don't know who did this dastardly deed, but we're going to find out. And when we find out, if the Congress needs to act to amend our laws in such a way as to to tighten the wicket by which people come into this country, then we can do it then. But it seems to me a bit precipitous that we would have the gall to try to determine beforehand what is wrong and what laws we need to change. And I mean that is no disrespect to anyone. Every member of Congress has the same basis upon which we operate. None of us elect each other. There's not another member of Congress who lives in my district, nor I and theirs, and they have the right to do whatever they wish. But it seems to me 
that as leaders, there ought to be another signal that we also send. We ought to send a strong plea for law enforcement. That's what many of my colleagues are doing here today, and that's altogether appropriate, and we should do it. <coughs> On the other hand, we also must send a message to the people out there who are watching television or who read newspapers who would, because they have some problems with their own identity, start to put pieces together that we haven't put together. Who would think that there is a jihad going on in this country and, and it's all right for us to go out as American citizens and be prejudiced against people who come from another country, who are a different faith than us, who look different than us, because we somehow associate all of these people together. Because that's what prejudgment is. It's lumping people together because they have some common characteristics, whether it's blonde hair or blue eyes or a common ethnicity, and assuming that because one is alleged to have done something, that they're all guilty. The message that we as members of Congress and leaders of our people, it seems to me, ought to be sending out is that that is not so. And as Americans, the last thing we want to do is to be guilty of prejudging other people. And the first thing that we want to do is make sure that the resources, the law enforcement resources are available so that whomever individuals were involved in this are brought to justice and that they get a fair trial in this country. I don't even know whether this fits the definition of terrorism yet. As I understand the definition of terrorism, it has to do with the motive of the incident. Now, these men may know, and I would join my friend from New Mexico in suggesting that we not ask that question, and I'm not going to ask it in this forum. They may know of the motive of the individual who's in custody. They may not know, but it would be altogether inappropriate for us to inquire about that at this time. It seems to me that we ought to first get to the bottom of what happened, how it happened, and who was involved, and, and let the law enforcement officials present that to a grand jury and let there be a trial on the merits of those matters and those allegations because whomever was involved is still entitled to the presumption of innocence under our law. America is a great country, and we don't change our laws because people who, who don't agree with our laws, who differ with the way that we do business, the time-honored method by which we have chosen to come forward as a democracy for over 200 years has served us well. And it seems to me that if we allow this incident that's the deed that it was to make us destroy the presumption of innocence, not for just these individuals, but for all individuals who are, who are brought before a court of justice and charged with a criminal offense in our society, then the greater harm would have been done to our Constitution. And it seems to me that, as I recall, someone said that no mob has ever protected any liberty, not even its own. We're not going to be a mob here today. We're going to ask, I hope, probing questions to get information. This is not a trial. This is not the forum at which we ought to make the ultimate determination as to what happened. And as I say, I, I, I'm certain that uh, I'd like to hear from my friend from Texas as to the circumstantial evidence that, that has been gathered so far, but based upon what I've read in the newspaper and based upon the, the cumulative wisdom of 20 years at the bar trying criminal cases, there's a great leap of faith between what information has been published or uttered in the public arena and, and going to convict someone because he attended a mosque where someone else was, some blind guy was a preacher. Come on now. This is the United States of America. And this is not going to happen, even on behalf of people who are elected to public office and who must necessarily respond to the public pressure that, that is justifiably uh, being brought upon us at this time. Mr. Chairman, I'm here, but I'm here to remind my friends and colleagues on the committee, that our responsibility, as I understand it, is not to try this case and not to assist the media in trying the case. And based upon some of the statements that I've heard here today, I would counsel all of my colleagues, who of course are all lawyers, uh, to be judicious in our statements, as the gentleman from New Mexico has said, but also to be judicious in the judgments that we make about what actually happened when we don't have the facts. And I thank the chairman for the time. I thank the gentleman, and uh, as both members of the majority and minority have said, the purpose here today is not to examine the specifics of this case, and in fact the chair will not 
entertain those kinds of questions. This is a more general issue. This is the first of a series of hearings to determine the general societal issues that this unfortunate incident has brought about. Nothing, nothing here should indicate that we're trying to try the case, and that's what I said, Mr. Sensenbrenner said, and I think everybody else said in the opening statements. The gentleman's uh, admonition, though, was, of course, welcome and underscores um, just what we're trying to do here. Uh, Mr. Geekus. Yes, I thank the chair. I agree with the gentleman from Washington that we are not in the business here of attaching blame at this point. The only thing that is certain is that five people were killed, a thousand people injured, countless millions of dollars of damage uh, inflicted upon the complex. And so those facts are indisputable, and we have to deal with those, and, and they're not, they, they're the starting basis for the debate that is yet to come. The the prosecution is eventually going to charge X, Y, and Z or more with uh, certain crimes. Already, some of the charges indicate that there is no question that there would be a federal jurisdiction and coexistent state jurisdiction wherever that may apply. Insofar as the federal jurisdiction is concerned, then we will have the duty to fill in when we can, if we can, to see what alternatives we can apply, even to the present case, even though we might face a, uh, a situation in which we might have to do something retroactively. But in doing that, I think the gentleman from Washington knows what I'm leading to, and that is that um, this is the kind of a case with the five deaths and the sheer terror and horror of the act that calls for the application in a due time with due evidence adduced to apply the death penalty in uh, this kind of situation. Now, we know that there are tremendous problems, uh, constitutional questions raised, etc., particularly on what I just touched upon, retroactivity. However, there is, and I want our colleagues to recognize this as we proceed along the debate, because I'm very, uh, I'm very insistent upon uh, delving into this uh, fully. There is a possibility that under the rulings in Profit versus Florida that did impose the death penalty after the Supreme Court had struck down generally the death penalty and then several states revived them uh, pursuant to the Furman admonitions, that in the Profit case, a killing took place after the court had struck down the death penalty, and then Florida, uh, the, the killing took place, and then Florida enacted the guidelines which many of us have been seeking for a generation here in, in the Congress to apply to, to a death penalty situation. And the, the Supreme Court uh, refused to hear the case and thus confirmed the propriety of the instituting guidelines to apply to a case so long as the the statute applicable has not been repealed. And, of course, it has not been repealed in the federal jurisdiction. I want to focus on this and to make sure that our witnesses will be giving us information here that will establish the federal nexus, the federal jurisdiction possibilities in this case, as have already been evidenced, but I think for the record of this subcommittee, the, the the establishment of the federal jurisdiction is very important. I have no further comments at this I thank point. the gentleman, only again with the same statement I made to Mr. Washington. It's not in our intent here to explore the specifics of this case, which is an ongoing investigation. Last opening statement for Mr. Mann, and I thank the witnesses for their patience. I have no statement. I thank Mr. Mann for his patience. Uh, okay, let's begin with uh, the first panel. Okay, will, uh, will uh, Mr. Kelly and Mr. Brezinoff please come forward? Commissioner Kelly and Mr. Brezinoff. Um, we're very pleased today to have with us as our first panel two of the New York City officials who have been most directly involved in dealing with this crisis. Police Commissioner Raymond Kelly, appointed in 1992 as a distinguished career with the New York City Police Department spanning 32 years. 
His many assignments throughout the department include service with the Crime Prevention Section and the Emergency Services Unit, in addition to command of the Special Operations Division. Mr. Brezinoff has also had a long career with the City of New York. Before being appointed Executive Director of the Port Authority, mm -hmm. 